Hillman, Humber, Singer, Talbot, Sunbeam, Carrier and Commer. These are names that were once a common sight on our roads, but have now vanished. The Roots Group was once a car empire to rival the giants of Leyland and BMC, an empire so vast it wholly controlled its own dealer and distribution network, going on to become the second largest British car manufacturer. But by 1971, this empire had collapsed. In this video, we are going to explore one of the most spectacular collapses in the history of the automobile, the lost empire of the Roots Group. From its humble beginnings as a small bicycle repair business, to its height as a manufacturing giant in 1960, and finally its downfall nearly a decade later in 1971. This is the rise and fall of the Roots Group. Hello everybody and welcome to this video. If you're not subscribed, please make sure to do so. It really does help me out and you get to see more of this. More history videos and more cool projects like Project 2600R, my Rover SD1 and my Ford Cortina project. This video is on an incredible lost empire, the Roots Group. And drop a comment below and drop a like on the video as well. Do you have any Roots Group memories of owning cars like Hillman's, Humber's or Singer's? And do you have any history or any insights that you'd like to share? Things that I've missed or cars that I might not have highlighted that you'd like looking into further. But without further delay, let's get in to the rise and fall of the Roots Group. Roots's humble beginning was in 1895 when William Roots Sr. opened a cycle repair business with £75 that he and his wife had saved. Their sons William Billy Roots and Reginald Claude Roots, known as Reggie, would later join the business. But first, these brothers would go their separate ways, during which they would learn the skills which would go on to complement each other's experience in the future, to turn a bicycle repair shop into a giant of industry. Billy took the practical approach. He went on to leave school at 15 and with his father's help, began an apprenticeship with Singer, making a penny an hour. Reggie continued his education, going on to join the civil service, working at the Admiralty. William Sr. showed great interest in a technology making its way into the public consciousness. And in 1899, William Sr. sold his first car. William Sr., with the help of Billy, would go on to expand the business further, creating a car sales arm of the original Root Cycle business. The business quickly expanded. In 1914, the war to end all wars began. Even during wartime, the progress of the Roots Group was unimpeded, with Billy serving in the Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve at Clement Talbot in London, where Rolls-Royce aero engines were repaired under contract for the government. This became a significant moment for Billy, observing this business to later create his own in 1917 in Maidstone, creating a new business venture, Roots Limited. Reggie would then join his brother at the business. The Roots brothers were together at last, forming a legendary partnership, with one brother termed the power unit and the other the steering and braking system. In 1920, the brothers purchased the motor car division of their father's business. Roots Limited would later expand further in the 1920s with Reggie's help. The company then started their own wholesale motor vehicle and distribution arm for other major manufacturers, going on to become Austin Motor Company's largest distributor. Within six years, the company had made £1.5 million, which is around £114 million today. The business then went on a spree of expansions and acquisitions to build the foundations for their own car business, acquiring Thrupp and Maberly, renowned coach builders for Daimler, Humber and Rolls-Royce. By 1927, the stage was set. The brothers had acquired other distributors as well to create an unrivaled distribution network. They had Len Engineering Works as well and a famous coach builder. These were the pieces of the puzzle that needed to be assembled to create a car empire like no others. And the two brothers had done it. During that same year, with a £1 million loan, the brothers acquired Humber, Hillman and Comer. With all three companies in need of modern machining tools to increase production and drive efficiency, this wasn't a problem for the now resource-rich Roots Company. This was a considerable achievement for the brothers. Both in their 30s were worth millions and had a distribution empire with the foundations to build a car manufacturing giant. After considerable investment by their parent company, Hillman would launch the Hillman Wizard in April of 1931, a six-cylinder passenger car with two models, the 65 and 75, relating to their ball size. The Wizard unfortunately wasn't the success the brothers had hoped, but there was a four-door saloon being developed that would change their fortunes. Launched later that year, the Hillman Minx was a small family car that became a near-immediate success, thanks to its reliability and, of course, its price. The Minx would go on to become somewhat of an institution. For 40 years, the Minx was a popular family car, sold all over the world. 
a testament to Billy's close involvement in the project. It would go on to be produced in various generations until 1970. In 1935, the group would welcome into the fold Sunbeam, Talbot and carrier commercial vehicles, all marks in need of serious investment. During the 30s, Roots had become a powerhouse and by 1937 employed 10,000 people, making all manner of cars from limousines like the Sunbeam Talbot 3 litre to the humble Hillman Minx. Roots Group at this time had one of the largest car export businesses in Britain. In 1939, at the outbreak of World War II, the brothers found themselves once again at the mercy of global conditions, but this time they had considerable resource at their disposal. The Roots Group had a significant contribution to the war effort, producing a staggering 1 in 7 of all bombers, 6 out of 10 armoured cars, and 50,000 aero engines for the British Armed Forces. By the end of the war, the company and its founders were recognised with an impressive number of decorations for their contributions, such as the George Medal and the Member of the Order of the British Empire. Post-war, the Roots Group shifted gears back to peacetime production. In its nearly bankrupted home country, customers were scarce, so cars were produced mainly for America and other export markets, concentrating all of its car production at the newly acquired Wrighton plant. The company also established subsidiaries abroad in Australia and Iran. The company would go into the late 1940s with an incredible lineup, such as the Humber Hawk, originally launched in 1945, being succeeded by the brand new Mark III Humber Hawk, a sleek four door family saloon launched in 1948. A new Hillman Minx was also launched that year, including an estate, saloon and a soft top, but retaining its predecessor's 1185cc side draft engine. Later that year, the Sunbeam Talbot 80 was also launched, a four-door sports saloon. Around this time, William Roots was presented with a car from the remnants of a defeated Germany, the VW Beetle, which was shipped to the UK after the war as Britain was instrumental in the plan to rebuild the war-torn Germany, which of course involved car production. A commission led by the now Sir William travelled to Germany to assess the Wolfsburg plant, but it was deemed unsuitable, but not just by the Roots Group. Ford also declined, as well as other leading manufacturers. The car this commission saw was not the classic Beetle we know of today. It was commonly thought that Sir William declined a production-ready Beetle, in one of the biggest blunders and missed opportunities of the British car industry, but this is not the case. The car they saw in 1948 was an early prototype, slow and unrefined, with a short expected life. The car was being pitched as a ready for production car, but the commission sent famously by both Ford and Roots identified it wasn't and declined. By the mid-1950s, Roots had unveiled their first cars of the new Audax range of mid-sized saloons. The new Sunbeam Rapier with a stylish monocoque body, powered by a 1390cc overhead valve engine fed by twin carbs. In 1956, the passenger car empire would expand even further when Roots Group welcomed Singer into the fold, launching the Singer Gazelle 1. This was it, the start of a golden age. During the mid to late 1950s, the company would launch some incredible cars. Humber would launch the Series 1 Humber Hawk, a completely new construction. This would be shared with the Humber Super Snipe Series 1 as well. Hillman would produce the Audax Minx, which... In Latin, Audax means bold, and this was a boldly styled car. This would build on the success of the previous Minx series. A new car was then introduced by Hillman in 1954 as well. A small three-door estate car, the Husky, another Audax car. Over at Sunbeam, the Rapier would be updated to the Series 2, incorporating a stunning convertible model as well as the standard two-door saloon. In the mid to late 1950s, the market positioning of the brands in the Roots Group looked like this. Humber and Singer were the luxury brands, with Hillman and Sunbeam falling underneath at the mid-range. A lack of a lower end was palatable in the 50s, but as the new decade approached, things would change. This meant the lowest cost car in their range was the Hillman Minx, at a price of £773.17 after tax. This compared with other small family cars like the A30 and later A35 which cost around £475 was considerably more expensive. In 1956 the problems with the Roots range were exposed even further with the outbreak of the Suez Crisis and the resulting fuel rations. While Britain's second largest car manufacturer was starting to experience a decline, Standard Triumph were flourishing with their frugal Standard 8 and the main competitor of the Roots group, BMC, were also doing well. 
thanks to their diverse range of cars, such as the Austin A30. In the late 1950s, Roots now had a problem, a range of products that only catered to the mid to high end market. Therefore, it was decided within the group to merge with Standard Triumph to bolster the top and bottom end, with the Triumph sports cars coming in at the top end and the small family cars of the Standard range, such as the Standard 8, coming in at the low end. For better or worse, this deal would eventually collapse. With no lower end, more affordable mark, the company was shut out of the ever-growing economy car market, which was exploding at the time thanks to the popularity of the Mini. At the start of the new decade of the 1960s, Roots would then make a decision on which its entire empire would rest. A small car had been launched by BMC one year earlier, this car taking the world by storm. This car was the Mini. A small economy car getting the nation moving, and Roots desperately needed to acquire their own piece of the action. As demonstrated earlier with the failed acquisition of Standard Triumph, without the ability to purchase a small car for their range, they would need to develop one themselves under Project Apex, the Hillman Imp. The result was a small rear engine car with an overhead cam alloy engine developed by Coventry Climax. Sadly though, the government got involved. The original plan was to produce the Hillman Imp in their home, in the West Midlands, with an expansion to the Wrighton plant, but this factory expansion was blocked by the government, demanding the Roots Group build a factory in economically challenged areas, leading to a plant being built near Glasgow, over 300 miles away from the heartland of the Roots Group. In 1961, during a time when the company's resources were stretched between a new £20 million plant being built and the costly development of a new model, a strike would take place that crippled the Roots Group steel pressings plant, costing the company three months of production due to the lack of body shell supply. This also cost the company lost production of over 50,000 cars at a crucial time when the company needed the money to develop the imp and build the new factory. The company was now on a knife edge after their £2 million loss of that year, thanks to the strike action. According to publications at the time, this strike action was caused by job security worries. Which is a bit ironic, considering they'd now started the beginning of the end for the Roots Group. More and more economy cars flooded the market, such as Ford's Anglia, taking away the Imp's market share before it even hit the road. The Imp was running behind schedule in development, resulting in cost overruns. Due to pressure from the government to get the Lindwood plant going, the Imp would be launched with compromises in May of 1963. During that month, His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh would open the plant officially, but there were smoke and mirrors at play. The imp driven by the Duke was one of only a dozen made, and the plant wasn't finished, with the uncompleted areas being hidden away. The imp then went into production later that year, but due to the rush development the car was harder to produce, and the impact this had was staggering. Quality issues and personnel issues plagued the imp's early production, but this wasn't the only problem it faced. The machining for the engines could only take place at Coventry due to the lack of adequate facilities in Linwood. This meant all engine blocks had to be sent from Glasgow to Coventry to be machined and then sent back again. The result of this was catastrophic and resulted in the imp being less competitive in the marketplace due to the increased cost of production. The imp on its launch would be sold for £508, which was £60 more than the Mini at the time. Today the imp would cost around £13,000. By the end of 1963 the company was still running at a loss, but some of their other models were still competitive. The venerable Minx was still a success, competing with the Ford Cortina and Vauxhall Victor. The Humber Scepter and Singer Vogue were also strong sellers that year. By 1964 Roots Group was still making a loss, when the company was approached by Chrysler, who wanted to get a foothold in the European market. A deal was struck between the two, with Chrysler purchasing 30% of the shares of Roots Group. Chrysler's influence would increase month on month, with more and more shares being acquired until it had a considerable stake, with considerable control. Sir William Roots would then retire in May of 1964, placing his brother Reggie as the chairman. Sir William would then pass away in December that year. The next year, another catastrophe would befall the Roots Group in 1965, with BMC's purchase of pressed steel, which produced body shells and panel work for all of Britain's major car manufacturers. This meant BMC essentially became the puppet master for the British car industry, with direct control over body shell supply for all major manufacturers, including, of course, the Roots Group. 
It is speculated that BMC requested Pressed Steel to prioritise the production of Austin Morris body shells to strangle other manufacturers' supply, but this is unconfirmed. The Linwood Pressed Steel operation would later be sold back to Roots. This was the beginning of the decline. Chrysler and the British government announced in 1966 that the Roots Group was to be taken over and renamed Chrysler Europe. Formed in 1967 with Reginald Roots passing the role of chairman to Sir William's son. In the late 1960s, it wasn't all bad news. Enter the long-awaited Arrow cars, the Hillman Hunter, Hillman Minx and the Humber Scepter Mark III. The future of the group was looking to be on the upturn after its American turnover, but sadly Humber and Singer were dropped by 1970, leaving Hillman and Sunbeam Talbot the only remaining marks. In 1970, another icon of British motoring was introduced, the Hillman Avenger. The first car to be developed after the Chrysler takeover in 1967, succeeding the Hillman Minx. The Avenger was supposed to be the Cortina killer and went on to have considerable success, also being sold in the US as the Plymouth Cricket. In 1972, an Avenger like no other was produced, an Avenger that most had forgotten, the Hillman Avenger Tiger. The naming scheme was used to evoke memories of the V8-powered Sunbeam Tiger, a version of the Alpine Roadster. The Mark I Tiger was equipped with a bonnet bulge and a distinctive colour scheme, Sundance Yellow, with spoilers, side stripes as standard, and of course, the Avenger Tiger branding on the rear quarters. All Avenger Tigers were assembled by the Chrysler Competition Centre, with only around 200 of the Mark I being produced. This forgotten performance icon beat the Ford Escort Mexico to 60 miles per hour at 8.9 seconds compared to the Mexico's 10.2 seconds, going on to a top speed of 108 miles per hour, 9 miles per hour more than the Mexico. This new Roots group, now Chrysler Europe, would be presented with another challenge, the 1973 oil crisis. The worst decision they could have made at this time was then made. The small economy car in American terms, the Plymouth Cricket, was discontinued, which meant the car would not be part of the small engine revolution that took place as the demand for more fuel efficient cars skyrocketed. A decision that deprived the cash strapped Chrysler Europe further. All of these poor decisions would come to a head, when in 1975 the company was near bankruptcy. The company was saved by a £125 million bailout by the UK government. The government also provided a £55 million grant to fund the development of a new small car. This new car was the Talbot Sunbeam, launched in 1976 to succeed the Imp and the Avenger, but the damage was done, so the poor little Sunbeam was not the ray of light Chrysler Europe had hoped, being snuffed out by past mistakes. The once proud empire then lost its second largest British manufacturing title, to Reliant. The end came in 1978 when Chrysler's new president sold the European operations to Peugeot for £1, something that would be almost echoed by BMW in 2000 with MG Rover. Peugeot shut down Linwood after only 18 years of production, and the last Hillman Avengers would then be rebadged as Talbot Avengers. After Hillman and Sunbeam were discontinued by Peugeot, Talbot would go on to be the sole survivor of Roots Group. Talbot would live on producing cars like the Solara, Tagora, Sunbeam and Samba. In the late 80s, due to the declining sales of the Talbot branded cars, Peugeot was questioning whether its operation should be sustained since it presented direct competition with its own models. Talbot's final act was with the Talbot Arizona, which was dropped to create the Peugeot 309. On the shop floors of Talbot's surviving plants in the UK, the badge would fade one car at a time until all models were replaced by Peugeot's. With the final remnant of the once massive Roots group gone, an empire to rival British Leyland finally faded away in 1995. The Roots Group is a British success story, founded by two brothers with help from their father in the early 20th century, which went on to become the second largest car manufacturer in the UK, and one of Britain's biggest exporters. On the other hand, from 1963 is also a story of an industry in decline, Poor decisions like the rushing of the imp, to the logistical issues presented by the Linwood factory's location, to its takeover to form Chrysler Europe. The Roots Group is just another example of an empire destroyed by mismanagement and poor decisions, and the decline of a once proud British car industry.